Dinah and Shechem. Before this story, we learned how Jacob feared the wrath of his brother Esau. He prayed to God with great anguish to deliver him. That night Jacob wrestled with God himself and had his name changed to Israel. Esau forgave Jacob, and the two went their way. Now we will learn about how Jacob's daughter Dinah was taken advantage of and the response made by Jacob's sons, Simon and Levi, inspired by the book of Genesis. Hello, I'm Pastor Jack Graham with today's episode of the Bible in a Year podcast. In our prior reading, we learned of Jacob's new name, Israel, and of his repentant heart, and that Jacob and Esau made peace with one another finally. It was a wonderful story of God's provision, grace, and blessing. And we saw a more mature, obedient Jacob who now seems ready to follow the will of God for his life. In today's reading, however, Jacob seems to take a step backwards. As you listen, notice how Jacob once again shuns the role of leadership to which God has called him. There will be a great deal of bloodshed, pain, and trouble that spreads through Jacob's family. Eventually, Jacob will wake up to the tragedies and schemes his disobedience have created and then turn to God, truly turn to God for help and guidance. God once again will prove his faithfulness to Jacob and his family because God is always faithful. Now, let's listen to today's scripture. Jacob and his family settled in a place God had not intended. He was supposed to return to Bethel, yet remained in the land near Hamor. Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, went out to visit some of the women in the neighboring city a few miles away. She walked with the innocent smile of someone painfully unaware of just how dangerous a city like this could be. Shechem, the son of Hamor, a prince of the land, saw Dinah from afar. Hidden by the shadows, he trailed her at a distance. Shechem found Dinah intoxicating. He drew closer and closer, watching as she maneuvered through the busy streets. Shechem, like many young rich rulers of his time, knew if he wanted something, he needed just take it for himself. And he wanted Dinah. He burned with a self-serving and violent desire. Shechem suddenly and secretly seized Dinah and drug her away. Flailing and fighting, Dinah realized there would be nobody there to help her. Shechem humiliated Dinah and raped her. Dinah was sent on her way humiliated and defiled. Yet instead of releasing her with threats, Shechem spoke tenderly and with gentleness. His soul felt drawn to Dinah, and he mistook his twisted and selfish desires with actual love and affection. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Word came to Jacob about the assault of his daughter. A contemplative calm came upon him. His sons were working in the field with the livestock, and he needed time to think before releasing the information to them. As Jacob waited in brooding silence, Shechem and his father Hamor came to Jacob to speak of marriage. He would not be able to get a word in before the sons of Jacob came racing in with rage. A small army of men ran from the fields as soon as they heard and immediately met them with indignant rage. Under no circumstances would they allow Shechem to have their sister. Hamor, finally able to speak after the barrage of angry brothers, turned to Jacob and said, Shechem's soul longs for your daughter, Jacob. Let us consider a marriage, and all my land can be opened up to you for trade, property, and farming. Shechem then began to speak. There was a look in his eyes, a look of genuine affection and love, yet behind them seemed to be a mind capable of hideous things. It sent an uneasy shiver down the spines of Jacob's brothers. He spoke, saying, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you desire from me I will give. Name your price, and I will honor it. Just please let me have Dinah as my wife. Jacob and his sons were men of God and had set themselves apart from the rest of the world. Yet their kindness was not weakness. They were men of honor and loved their sister deeply. Their resolve to protect her would not wane. The brothers answered Shechem and Hamor. 
It would disgrace us to give our sister to someone uncircumcised. Our only condition is that you and all your men be circumcised. Then we will give all our daughters to be with your men in marriage, and we can become one people sharing in all things. These words pleased Hamor and Shechem. Not only did Shechem get his desire, but the whole land would get to share in the abundant resources of Jacob's family. Yet they rejoiced naively, for Jacob's sons would not forgive what Shechem had done to their sister. As promised, Hamor and Shechem went to all of the men in their land and had them circumcised. Men, young and old, took blades to their foreskins. Hamor's people did so gladly, though in a great amount of pain, because they knew they were going to become rich, and Shechem would get Dinah. Shechem took Dinah to his home, and she dwelt there for three days under his roof, captive and afraid. On the third day, the city was quiet. The sun was making its way down towards evening. The heat of the day was colliding with the cool breeze of evening. The men of the land were resting, sore, and doing their best to not make any sudden movements. The pain was nearly unbearable, but worth it for more livestock and influence. While they all remained in their beds, two pairs of footsteps can be heard coming through the gates. Two sons of Jacob, Simon and Levi, entered the city with swords in their hands. No mercy. No politics or chances to plead their cases. No negotiations or empty threats. With ferocity and decisiveness, the two plunged their swords into the flesh of all Hamor's men. They would try to run, but they couldn't, because they were still in pain from the circumcision. This was their plan all along. Get the men weak, so they could enter in and take their lives easily. Picking up speed, the two brothers swung their swords with revenge, making their way to the home of Hamor and Shechem. Hamor was the first to die. His begs for mercy were interrupted by Simon's right arm slowly gliding the blade against his throat. The two brothers turned right through the hall and burst through Shechem's door. There they saw him and their sister. Pulling Dinah away, they pointed their swords lightly on the chest of Shechem. They stared into his eyes, the same eyes that had gazed upon their sister with violence and lust, now looked upon them with fear and trembling. No mercy. Shechem fell swiftly under the blades of Simon and Levi. The only inheritance he would get from his marriage to Dinah was iron sinking into his lungs. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field. All their wealth, all their children and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and took back with them. No mercy. When they returned, Jacob was outraged. He said to Simon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. We do not have the same numbers they do. If they gather themselves against me and attack me, we shall be destroyed. Simon and Levi regretted nothing. What should we have done, they said? Allow our sister to be shipped off like a piece of property? Have her ravaged like a prostitute? Jacob, pressed with fear and anxiety, went before God. God spoke plainly. Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar for me, as you did before you met with Esau. So Jacob left for Bethel, as he should have done in the first place. He and his household came before God. Cleanse yourself. Change your garments, wash, throw away any idols you may have, and purify your hearts, Jacob commanded his people. A great danger threatens us, but we will arise to Bethel to seek God, who has always answered me wherever I go. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods that they had, and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. They journeyed far, fearful for their lives, they rushed to Bethel. God in mighty power caused a terror to fall upon the cities that surrounded them. They would not pursue God's chosen people. Jacob came to Bethel, back to the land of Canaan, and there he built an altar and called. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. 
Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings will come from among you. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. God blessed Jacob and his family, the people of Israel, and he would not leave them, no matter what hardship they found themselves captive to. Jacob encountered God, wrestled with him, and received his blessing. He has now made peace with Esau and is free to return to the place where God intends for him to live with his family. But that's not the choice Jacob makes. Instead of going to Bethel, he remains in another land nearby that's ruled by a man named Hamor. Jacob's daughter, Dinah, visits the nearby city controlled by Shechem, and as she is walking through town, Hamor's son, Shechem, pursues and rapes Dinah. Then he begins to feel what he considers love for this woman. Of course, this is not a God-honoring love. This is lust. This is a man who forced himself upon a young woman. But in his twisted mind, he somehow feels some affection for her and asks his father to secure a marriage with her. Jacob hears what happened to Dinah, and rather than acting, he remains silent. He doesn't tell his sons of the rape either. Perhaps he knew they were prone to violence, or maybe he was slipping back into his old complacent ways and failing to lead his family. Whatever the reason, he does nothing. But when his sons hear what happened to Dinah, their sister, they intend to avenge her. When Hamor and Shechem come to ask for Dinah's hand, Jacob takes a back seat in the conversation. Hamor offers a political and financial alliance if they will allow Shechem to marry Dinah. Jacob's sons counter that all males in Hamor's land must be circumcised before they will allow Dinah to marry Shechem. Their true intention was never to bring these men into a relationship with God. It was a mere ruse of war to buy some time before their full plan was set in action and perhaps cause Hamor and his men some serious discomfort in the meantime. Jacob's sons attacked these men when their guard was down due to a negotiated treaty and killed them all and rescued Dinah. This may seem like justice, but it's far from it. They used a sacred act ordained by God, not for a holy purpose, but for bloodshed, vengeance, and plunder. Hamor and Shechem's actions were not honorable, but neither were the actions of Simeon and Levi. And when Jacob discovers what they've done, he is shaken out of his complacency and once again attacked with fear. He knows his son's actions could bring calamity upon his own family. So once again, he goes to God and God tells him to go to Bethel and build an altar to him there. It was what he was supposed to do from the beginning in obedience to God, but now he finally obeys. How often do you and I go through unnecessary and unwanted trouble simply because we're not listening to God? If we would only do what God says from the beginning, we would not face so many of the trials and struggles and difficulties that we face. Before he flees to Bethel, Jacob knows he and his family must leave behind not just the land, but the gods and idols they're holding on to instead of the one true God who is always with them, always faithful. We close today's story with another example of this faithfulness of God to Jacob. He strikes fear in the cities around Jacob, so nobody pursues Jacob's family, and he can safely arrive at Bethel. God once again affirms the promise he's made to Jacob and to Isaac and to Abraham before him. He will give him this land, and from him will come many nations and kings. And a key figure in this plan is one of Jacob's son, Joseph, whose colorful story will begin next time. Dear God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, thank you today for what we have read in your word and that it teaches us that obeying you is always the right plan, the best plan. Thank you that when we fail to obey, there is forgiveness when we turn to you in confession and repentance because you are always faithful to forgive and cleanse us through your son, Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray, amen. Thank you for listening to today's Bible in a Year podcast. 
I'm Pastor Jack Graham from Dallas, Texas. Download the Pray.com app and make prayer a priority in your life. If you enjoyed this podcast, share it with someone you love. By sharing this podcast, you can make a difference in someone's life. And if you want more resources on how to tap into God's power for successful Christian living, be sure to visit jackgraham.org. God bless. This episode is sponsored by MediShare, an innovative healthcare solution for Christians to save money without sacrificing quality.